I can't help but feel a little guilty being Norse pagan. I can't help but feel a little guilty being Norse pagan. I feel like I'm not as valuable of a Norse pagan. I feel like I feel not as valuable as a Norse pagan. I won't feed you more narratives of blood quantum and uh, imposter syndrome than this, as they are all products of a latent Christianity and how it affects us in our daily lives and crafts as pagans. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What about uh, this instead? I wonder what Yur thinks of the waterfalls in Japan, what Freya says about the witches of Benevento, what Odin thinks about Dante's Inferno. Surely the Norse gods marveled at your homelands and magic. Whether we want it or not, we are all a part of Kinungagab. Our souls arise from it and take shape from there. Whether we accept it or not, past is a foreign country to us all. So the healthiest medicine I can recommend is to embrace the dilemmas. None of us was born where our spirituality thrived. The most unhealthy thing you can possibly think of doing is to live your Norse craft, constantly choosing to bathe in a river of ever-present nostalgia and spectrality. Both uh, Christian narratives and Viking narratives are going to be your possible worst uh, allies if you are approaching Norse witchcraft and spirituality. Your craft has been blinded to the true Norse way because of the media and the falsehood shared for better ratings. The Norse way was not all about the gods or magic or Valhall. Most stones we find erected are about people. Your craft as the ancient North Norwegian grounds I walk every day doesn't need stereotypical Viking narratives. It needs self-reliance, initiative and ruggedness. It needs you outside of the myth. So my best advice to you watching this is to stop flirting with surreal imagery or bravery of the Vikings, of tough Viking competition. Stop telling yourself you should stop freezing in sub-zero temperatures because you are a Viking as Vikings froze to death too. The next time you drink mead, I would highly recommend not thinking about a blood eagle scene, but about the bees that contributed to the making of that mead, as this will make your celebration more real and will contribute to re-establish a normality that is terribly needed these days.
Your craft doesn't need the Christian narratives either, ranging from feeling guilty for leaving the faith to developing a terrible fear of not seeing loved ones in the afterlife. From never is good enough to you must always be better, kinder, where all appears to be a have to rather than choose to. If you are a Christian and you cannot even explain why you are a Christian, if you are on a Norse path and you cannot even explain why, what is the point of keep staying under that comfort blanket? Whatever is your upbringing, we all need to take responsibility for the past. And how do we do that? We embrace its ghosts rather than chasing them away. emotions are not a burden, they are valid tools. We are made to feel the feelings, so sit with those emotions. When we suffer shame, we suffer an identity crisis, leading to the disappearance of the self. We cannot accept ourselves to fade away. We release shame when we root out the inauthentic and when we encourage the authentic. We gift our entire lives to the eyes of others and choose to worship moral sensitivities and be consumed by them. We feed the gods of shame and they become so powerful. They can be felt just by association. Our families often are such incredible swamps of emotional activation, generation upon generation of repressed emotions of blame, shame, guilt, resentment, rage, frustration. They are all uh, there, constantly shimmering, from time to time boiling up, being thrown at each other, activating even more painful emotions. There is only one thing that has the power to trump shame, and that is pride. By bringing shame to light, depriving it of its thriving grounds of darkness, we learn to expose it and give it back forcefully. I have a story for you. One day, reindeer came to the edge of the sea, tasted the salty water, washed his hoops and stood there resting. That was when fish stuck his head out of the water and said, I've been looking at you, reindeer, and I'm amazed at how ugly you are. Your antlers are crooked and your legs are skinny and bent. The reindeer hooked the fish with its antlers and tossed him onto the shore. The fish, gasping on the rocks, says, Throw me back into the sea, my friend, before I dry in the wind and die. Reindeer felt sorry for him and tossed the fish back into the water. A few moments later, the fish stuck his head out of the water and began saying again, Even though you've got four legs, you can't swim like me. At this, reindeer hooked the fish with his antlers and tossed him onto the rocks again. Once again, the fish pleaded, Throw me back into the sea, friend, before I die. I will never make fun of you again. 
Since the fish was indeed dying, reindeer tossed him back into the water. The fish surfaced and again. Why you don't even have a tail? What an ugly thing you are. It makes me sick just to look at you. Reindeer tossed the fish far up on the shore and then walked off into the mountains for good. For every thought of shame, my friends, remember that the sacrificial stones whisper, the beams of the hut wave, the fireplaces call out, and some humans are born with a human hand and a reindeer hoof. And this is just a splendid fact of life. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.